Welcome to Unmasking Humanity 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. I'm your host, Joshua. Thank you so much for being here today. We are broadcasting on the World's Mayor Experience platform, and today is going to be awesome. Let me, I should tell you where the platform can be found first, and that's www.joshuatberglund.com. So thank you so much for all of your support. Thank you for checking out the platform, checking out the books, the movies, all the different uh, variations of broadcast and uh, tons of education. Thank you so much all, again for your support. Now today is gonna be a really fun broadcast. Not only am I talking to somebody who's extremely media savvy, in fact, has had her network for over 23 years, which is not easy. As someone, um, you know, my background or part of my background is running OTT networks and understanding how that business works. And frankly, our guest is one of the best. Um, but with that said, there's so much more to her and I'm gonna read you a little bit about her. But one of the focuses of today is gonna be crowdfunding. And she is, our guest, is really one of the best people in the world to learn from, as this is her specialty. It's a niche for her, but she's very, very well-rounded. Let me tell you about our guest before we bring her on. Dr. Letitia Wright is the executive producer and host of Wright Place TV, which has run on cable for over 22 years. A former chiropractor, Dr. Wright transitioned into the world of media. Wright Place TV is in its 23rd season with a bandwidth spanning over 6.5 million homes throughout Southern California and beyond. In addition to her media work, she is a top 100 crowdfunding expert in the United States, focusing on putting funding and money into the hands of women and minority owned businesses. As America's crowdfunding strategist, Dr. Letitia Wright was part of the 2018 November faculty of Accelerated Business Schools in Thailand. In March of 2018, she was honored by the All Ladies League and the Women's Economic Forum in Holland. Shout out to the World Economic Forum. If you know, you know. Anyway. She also joined WAVE based in Holland to help combat women's economics around the globe. Dr. Wright taught up taught at Dallas Startup Week. Oh, we have that in common. In 2016. Soon after the event, she was contacted and traveled to Maui on an open invitation to be present and speak into the lives of participants for Maui in Oahu Startup Week 2016. I got to do Startup Week in San Diego. That is a that is an event. It is so much fun. Anyway, she has been on the list of top 100 crowdfunding experts for the last four years and was invited to President Obama's Global Entrepreneur Summit summer of 2016. You can find her on TikTok at your crowdfunding expert. She's at Dr. Wright on Instagram, Dr. L. Wright on Facebook. And on LinkedIn, Dr. Letitia Wright, and that's spelled D-R-L-E-T-I-T-I-A-W-R-I-G-H-T. Anyway, our guest, as you just heard, is extremely, extremely accomplished. And uh, based on who she was referred to me by, I think I said that correctly, uh, she, this is going to be great because the person that does her PR is absolutely wonderful and she sends me the best guests. So I'm so excited to get into this and to learn with all of you about crowdfunding. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my new friend, Dr. Wright to Unmasking Humanity 21 Questions with Joshua T. Burma. And we're back to Unmasking Humanity 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. I am so excited to introduce to you all Dr. Wright. This is going to be such a fun broadcast. And we were getting to chat a little bit uh, before I hit record. And I got to tell you, I'm already loving the vibe. I've got chills. I got a smile on my face. And I don't always get that before a broadcast. So I'm excited. I'm sincerely excited. I'm full of joy about this because this is going to be informative. It's going to be powerful. And frankly, this is a message that we all need to hear. And I said, yes, all, because what she's going to talk about, what these questions are geared towards is just very valuable information that we can all use. So 
get a notepad, pay attention, and uh, let's have some fun. So without further ado, let's please welcome my new friend, Dr. Wright to Unmasking Humanity, 21 Questions with Joshua T. Berglund. Dr. Wright, how are you today? I am well. Thank you so much for having me. We're going to have a lot of fun. I, I'm having fun with you too. So I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Excellent. Let's get into it. And before we, uh, before we get into your 21 questions, I would love to know, what are you grateful for today and why? I'm grateful for uh, a very big project that my family is doing. Mm. We're, it's a very big project. It's going well. And there are a lot of changes, a lot of moving pieces and a lot of changes. And uh, it's sometimes it's been a little stressful. Sometimes it's, you know, a little more fun and it's not. But I'm very grateful to see the larger part of my family, not just my immediate family, but larger pieces of my family coming together for this project. And it's moving along. And so, um, yes, it's bouncy. Yes, it's a lot of changes. Uh, yes, my household here doubled in size between January and May, and uh, but it's all good and it's just really precious. It's a really growing time for me, but and for everybody, I'm sure everybody's going through the growing pains. But uh, 2024 has been a fantastic yellow submarine ride, and mm -hmm. I am grateful for it. I'm grateful for it. Love that gratitude answer. I get so excited when I get good ones. I just that was a great one. I love it. And one of the things that you touched on, um, the the project that you're working on, I'm going to assume that media is involved with it a little bit, um, just with your background and expertise. And one of the things that I find quite beautiful, um, I used to always hear when I was an evangelist, what the you know, what the devil or the enemy will try to use to kill you, God will use for your good. Um, and and so it, it makes me think of media and how media has been used to tear us apart. And yet the very thing and the reasons I got into media is because we have an opportunity to control the narrative. So if we take the power that lies in the hands of a few, we can blow it up and distribute it into the hands of millions. And that's the power of independent media. That's the power of what you've been displaying your whole career. And one of the favorite things that I love to talk about with that is that while media has divided us, this opportunity that we have right now going into the fourth industrial revolution is for media, not just to help heal our communities, but also to help heal our families because everyone can be involved in this new game of media, including your children. Because if they're on TikTok and Facebook, guess what? They really could run their own media organizations and why not learn working with their parents? So. We're going to touch on some of those questions today, but your gratitude really lit me up because one, it was great gratitude, but two, the underlying message and meaning of what you're doing is going to impact so many people, um, people that you may not even realize, but you're setting the tone like you've done your whole career and these 21 questions are going to be a lot of fun. You ready to get into it? I'm ready, Joshua. Let's go. <laughs> awesome. All right. Question one. As America's crowdfunding strategist, what's the most innovative campaign you've seen that really pushed the boundaries of crowdfunding? I would say um, <laughs> it, it wasn't my campaign, but the there was a campaign for a metal straw that you could fold up and keep in the in a little pouch, and so that we could stop using plastic straws. I would I would tell everybody for homework go to YouTube and look up the video they made. The video they made was fantastic. And um it costs a lot of money to make that video. Don't don't get me wrong, it's probably not something you can replicate on a small budget, but the ideas and how they did everything was really really great. And um it emphasized the media part of crowdfunding. That's one of the things I love is I love looking at crowdfunding videos. I'm always disappointed when someone in film is trying to raise money and all they have is a photo or blurry video. Mm -hmm. um, not good. Uh, but I think that one, that one is a, 
one of the most, I have three. That one's the one of the most entertaining, big budget, wow, you know, wow factor. The video and the, the video that got me into crowdfunding, very old, because I've been doing this since 2010. This video got me into crowdfunding, got me interested in crowdfunding and got me saying, okay, I need to understand this. And it's called, again, you can find this on YouTube, a pug named Fender, a pug named Fender. And what it was is that this guy, um, who was a, a friend of mine, uh, kind of TikTok friend, he had a comic strip named after his real life dog named Fender after Fender Rhodes music. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, Fender passed away. Fender had some sort of operation that little boxers have that can be dodgy and uh, Fender passed away. And so he was very heartbroken. And what he did was his, he started making online comics about Fender meeting all of these hip hop artists. He got permission from Common, from Lettucey, from all these different people. And so then he was putting them into a book to sell. And, uh, it's a really great video. Everybody loves it. That's one that I teach from. These are the three that I teach from. And then there was one that I did work on uh, the campaign called I Used to Be You. Very heart touching. A, a photographer is putting together, wanted to put together a book of pictures of elderly people. And all of the elderly people she approached didn't want to do it, didn't want to do it. So what she did was she went to a thrift store and she found a wig and she found some old clothes. And so she would dress as an elderly woman and take the pictures of herself in different scenarios. And so she would become kind of this character, very sweet book. All of those were successful campaigns, uh, but they're my favorites. They're the ones I teach from. I think they push the boundaries. Uh, nobody expects what they're going to see on the screen. So those are the three. I like that a lot. Question two, how has your background in chiropractic medicine influenced your approach to media and business? Well, it, it makes me a really good note taker and it makes me able to really look at some of the details, like not miss some of the details. Some people who are coming from a different area into media, some of the details are very difficult for them to get. Uh, the other thing is that I'm able to make people comfortable, just like you make people comfortable. I'm not going to talk about what you told me ahead of time, but I do something very similar and um, I can make people comfortable. That's really my gift. When we're on the set and people are nervous, I can instantly bring them down. And so uh, I think being a physician really informs a lot of what I do. And uh, I know I can get a lot of insight. I know when people aren't feeling well. I know when we have something different. Um, and so I'm not thrown off. I'm not, you know, icked out. Um, <laughs> so funny. I was at the studio the other day and I said ick about something. And one of the crew members was laughing. They said, oh, my God, we found Dr. Wright's ick. But, you know, I don't I don't usually, you know, get that way. And so I think it helps a lot. Mm, I love that. Yeah, you do have a calming presence. I love it. Uh, question three, with Right Place TV spanning over 6.5 million homes, mm -hmm. what's the most impactful story you've covered in your 23 years? I have to be honest, way back in the day before I had all this, the most impactful story that I covered is that when Amber Alerts were, this is how long I've been in the business, when Amber Alerts were first being created, I was able to cover and interview one of the first two girls that were rescued via oh, wow. an Amber Alert. I think that was the most impactful um, because I got to share, you know, some other famous children's stories where they've disappeared. Uh, these two girls, it was in it was in California, and these two girls were kidnapped, kind of from a little bit of a lover's lane area. So they were there with other people in other crowds. This guy came and got them took them, things happened, some negative things happened. The police wound up having a shootout to get these girls back. And yeah, it was, it was, it was bad. Now this is, this is, you know, I've been doing Right Place TV since 2000. So this is around 2005, 2006. 
And so um, I was working with the Missing you know, Children's Foundation. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's one of the most impactful you know, ones. Uh, the out of the two girls, one was I completely I don't want to talk to anybody, I don't want to be seen, I don't want to talk about it. She was like not having any part of it. The other one uh got therapy and embraced what had happened. She's an advocate, she went on to go to college, she's doing very well in her life, but she took a lot, you know, she took a lot of initiative to heal. So I think that that was when I really realized that my show could have an impact bigger because i just had focused on business before that bigger than local business um now uh that's a little bit of an older stat so i just want to throw this in right place tv is featured on roku amazon fire tv and apple tv so we have national and international um reach now and congratulations on that thank you um and it, it's interesting too because you use an example of two and it's the perfect choice i mean working with the underserved you know which part of that is people that are, are struggle with disabilities whether it's quadriplegia or als or muscular dystrophy or um and cerebral palsy even mm -hmm. you know i think about all the patients i've worked with over the years before i got into got into media and it was always there was a choice you met one one half of what i met were people who gave up and said screw it i'm you know i'm done my life is over mm -hmm. and other people goes well I, I i have no feeling for my neck down but i'm going to become a skydiving elvis and they <laughs> because that's what they dreamed of doing and they didn't stop and it's really interesting how we have that choice and i know that not every situation is the change but one of the powers of media that you're utilizing and giving people a platform and sharing those stories is really exposing the choice that we have, that we all get to have. What are we going to do with our hardship? So I really like that you pointed that out. Um, question four, you've been recognized as a top 100 crowdfunding expert for several years. How has the crowdfunding landscape evolved since you entered the field? Well, that's a really fun question because the fintech industry has mm. come up and joined with crowdfunding. And I think that the two together are growing exponentially. So I love that. I love what I'm seeing there. A lot of people are really afraid of it, but it's just, if you understand how money works, you're fine. Mm. It's just like currently right now, TikTok, everybody's talking about the Chase Bank glitch it's not a glitch it's oh. the old-fashioned check typing <laughs> yes, it and it's like oh i get it these young people because we use our cards to swipe so much and people are not writing checks like they used to they don't understand how checks work it's really financial illiteracy mm -hmm. that got them in trouble somebody told them that because if you tell that story to anybody over 50 they're going to be like no that's not how banks work like no, you can't do that. But they're catching young people. The young people are who, unfortunately, will be going to jail over that. So again, that's the same thing with fintech. Uh, you just need to learn it a little piece by piece, dabble in it every day so you can learn it. But putting together, putting it together with crowdfunding can really raise you a lot of money very, very quickly. A hundred percent. The new ecosystems, the digital ecosystems that we're all going into, the communities, tribes, communities, whatever it may be, you know, there's a time, talent, treasure element to it to even enter the ecosystem. So you can invest a lot of different ways, but everything, it's really a shared economy. It's, 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 a, it's a fair economy, I believe, that's being built in these ecosystems. And of course, they don't all have their complete funding yet, and it's not fully operational. But I got to tell you, 90% of my meetings are going into ecosystems and working and collaborating and finding people that are like-minded, it's really a beautiful thing because from my experience, and I think you can speak on this too, the people that are in those ecosystems are there because they believe in seeing a better world for all. That's why they made the sacrifices. That's why they've invested there. That's why they've put their time and talent there because they all wanna be a part of this new world. And while a lot of people were distracted by what's happening on TikTok, there's other people working in the shadows in a good way to bring a better world. And we're gonna get to see it. 
it's an, it's a beautiful thing. All right. Number five, can you share an example of how your work has directly impacted a woman or minority owned business through crowdfunding? Oh gosh, I sure can. So, uh, again, I'll refer to uh, a lady, a young lady on TikTok. She is a fantastic marketer. She has an upscale lounge wear line and uh, she was a little frustrated. She was a little stuck on, you know, she needed some more money to come in and figuring it out. We talked on the phone. I didn't charge her. I just admired what she was doing and, and I talked to her. And so I gave her the plan on how she could raise $5,000 in the next two weeks. And because she's an excellent marketer, she understood what I said, and she followed the instructions without changing the order. She was able to raise five thousand dollars, and you know, th not that she didn't need more money than that, but she was. She saw, oh, I can do this strategy to go with my business that's already up and running, mm -hmm. and bring in money. So uh, I feel like I definitely had an impact on her, and I definitely was able to talk to her at kind of a little bit of a low point, and you know get her back on track um the other other she's not she's an older lady she has a nonprofit where she helps cancer patients in los angeles she what she does is she's helping them when they're in treatment so when you're in treatment of cancer a lot of people don't feel well it's not like the movies where you got somebody sitting there holding you every day some people don't have anybody some people uh their health insurance is with their job. So when they're out of work for a long period of time, they no longer have coverage. They need to eat. They need help getting dressed. Sometimes they need, she has uh, like nurses aides that are trained to help go in and work with cancer patients. So every year I would work with her and crowdfund $5,000 for something she called Christmas in July, where she went to the children's hospital. And she brought the kids. Uh, she was already set up with the hospital. They know her. She's been doing it for years, probably 15 years now. And so she sets up the children. Uh, we get we get crowdfund the money, get the money to her. But she buys a what she calls a soft toy and a hard toy. So the hard toy is usually a computer, a tablet, something where they can kind of keep up their schoolwork and keep connection. The soft toy is a teddy bear or something that they can hold and kind of be there because the reality of children who are suffering in, in the hospital and having cancer treatments. And this is why you have Ronald McDonald houses because a lot of children's hospitals, they're, they're not, a lot of people live close to a children's hospital. So the parent can't be there every day. The parent still has other children. The parent still has a job. We see in the movies, a parent is with that kid all day in the movie. And I'm thinking, who's taking care of the other kids and how are y'all paying bills if both of the parents are at the hospital all day but mm -hmm. you know that's the doctor and me that's all you know it's like what's going on in this movie <laughs> the real life thing is that uh it's a really a sacrifice and so like ronald mcdonald house is a place for families to stay so they can be close to their child so what she does is she has a soft toy that is a comfort toy for the children uh because they often are going through a treatment and know there's not a parent or a grandparent or anybody there to hold their hand and um I think, you know, her seeing that, hey, she could do this every year, we could do this every year was a great thing. And again, she was not looking for people to come to the hospital. She had that covered and in, they're very strict about that. And the toys all have to be brand new and sterile. So she has a very specific. So she didn't want anybody to give her anything. She needed money. And so that was great. I love it. That's so good. Next question, six. What's the most surprising insight you gained while teaching at the Accelerated Business Schools in Thailand? Oh, well, the surprising two things. One thing that when uh, the Accelerated uh, moves from country to country, this year it's going to be back in Thailand, I believe. Um, you know, I'm down for it wherever they're going, but, you know, I've taught all over the world. And so different places respond differently. Um, and so Europeans don't like all the American rah, 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 it kind of turns them off. So that's the one thing I had to adjust, remember to adjust for the country that I'm in mm -hmm. and not teach necessarily the way I would here in, a, in the U.S. The second biggest insight that's aligned with that is that uh, we get a review. Everybody, everybody who teaches get a review. And I literally had someone on the review go, 
uh, I, I taught that you can be in another country and, and crowdfund in America because we have a lot of crowdfunding sites. And this person said, I don't believe you. You're lying about that. <laughs> I was like, do you really think I got up here and I'm lying? I'm like, I, I, I that dim, that, that confounded me. So uh, I, that was a surprising insight is that some people will not buy into anything I have to say, even though they paid over $10,000 to be in the class. I, I'm one of the teachers there. I'm, I'm, you know, and they've, they pay good money to be there and don't believe a word I'm saying. So that, those are the two insights. <laughs> I love it. Question seven. How do you see the intersection of media and crowdfunding evolving in the next five to 10 years? Well, I think that um, one of the things is that we will have a lot more media projects directly called, uh, I'm sorry, directly connected to crowdfunding and asking for connection and funds. We're starting to see that with a couple of films. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I think that it's going to expand to TV especially because we're having this big shift in media where a lot of the studios in Hollywood are going to these new places in Vegas that are set up to do film a lot cheaper, but still close to California and that sort of thing. So we're having a change in the film and television industry. Media is changing uh, media for the first time. News journalists had to compete with influencers and they were not happy about that uh the harris campaign was sort of a uh testing ground for that but what it turns out is that the the influencers were able to get out information much faster than the journalists were they just move faster and uh the journalists did not appreciate that the, the influencers were elevated to a level where they could get the information they needed and then go back and, and have places and plugs and do what they need to do and get the information out. So I think that, you know, crowdfunding and media are going to come together a lot more and there'll be, uh, there are a lot more companies that are crowdfunding their next film, having people buy shares. I think it's going to grow. 100%. 100% agree. There, some even the new OTT networks, I won't say their name out of respect, um, the way that they're getting projects funded is so innovative, but it's giving everyone an opportunity. Like, and, and here's the thing, the old guard of Hollywood and the entertainment business and media, I don't think they ever took the new media very serious, and now it's too late. <laughs> because right. the cat's out right. of the bag. I was like, you don't, you don't necessarily... Need, if, don't get me wrong. I mean, I would love love, love to be picked up. Uh, but one of the things is I had a meeting years ago with BET that were very sweet, but Right Place TV had been on the air for like seven years already. Mm -hmm. So the challenge for them picking it up would be like they were saying, this is a really great show, but it's already been on the air and we won't take on the liability of, we would have to take on the liability of the last seven years along with whatever we're projecting going forward. And, you know, I, I just think, we don't have to go mainstream. It's lovely if we can, but um, you don't have to, and you can still make an impact on your tribe. A hundred percent. I well, my issue with network and the reason why I quit. I mean, I was a, I've run networks and been a part of it, but I wanted freedom of speech. And the one thing I will never do is compromise on what I want to talk about because what I want to talk about is what I'm led to talk about and what I'm called to talk about. And having been deplatformed de as much as I have, I'm like, you know what? I'm taking Master P's advice and I'm putting all the power in my own hands and I'm That's doing it this way. And now, you know, I, I there's no looking back. And I'm excited about that because again, I can talk about what I want to talk about. Um, but you're what you're what you're saying makes so much sense. And and it's and I hope that it's exciting the audience because this means that we all get to be in the game if you just are willing to take the step and do it. And the exactly. cool part is you don't need any talent that you don't have. You don't need any gifts that you don't already have. And you don't need intellectual property that you don't have because what you have is enough for this new economy that we're going into that's driven by media. Anyway, question eight. 
Absolutely. Oh, can I just add this one thing? So you mentioned Master P. Yeah. I also look at Master P as uh, definitely an influence on there. And I just want to explain to the viewers, the reason why he mentioned Master P is because Master P is a great example of getting your own distribution. He was out there, you know, in the street selling drugs, but he understood distribution. And then when he wanted to get his music out, he was able to use the same strategy and distribute his music and he was making millions. They came to him to sign him up because he was already making money without them. They wanted to be part of that distribution network. And okay. so um, now, years later, Master P has cleaned up his whole thing so much. He's a Disney daddy. He's been on four different shows as a Disney daddy. He's got his kids signed up being Disney kids on TV because he understood distribution. And that is how he was able to create create as well. So I believe that's what you were connected to. And I just wanted to share that with people. Oh, I was, a, yeah, I was a backup dancer in Little Romeo's video when I was in college. Oh uh, he did God. a remake of Take Two, the MC Rob Bay song. I was a backup dancer. And the whole time I was wanting to smoke pot with Master P thinking I was going to party with him. And, you know, I'm a punk college kid. <laughs> and, and he gave me business advice instead. And I got to tell you, I don't know why I remembered it. I don't even remember yesterday half the time, but I remember everything he said to me word for word, like it was etched into my heart. I and bet. my, I mean, I literally without him and then Nipsey Hussle did the same thing mm -hmm. without their influence. And what I learned, I would not have, I don't believe I would have the vision for what I have the vision for to build what I've built and building and it, it like it's all, I like literally can go back to Master P, and it's just and now oh by the way now he's teaching, now he's I saw on the that. speaking yeah he's on the speaking tour but he's not giving away, he's not giving the full secrets away but he's giving a lot away so I'm not I saying he's not I giving value not him. yeah I think it's him with some other people so maybe yeah. it's not crafted to his particular liking you know what I mean how he really wants to do it and he's just kind of trying it out but yeah I saw that. Yeah. Listen to him. Like he okay. legitimately, I'm not telling you to, I'm telling the audience. Like I, like I put on my own courses. I'm just letting you know that if you see that course and you want to go, oh God, another course by a celebrity. No, that, listen, master, you want to learn from him or learn from me <laughs> or, or talk to right either way. But because we, we understand what's happening here. All right, let's go to the next question. Um, this is actually, I lost my, my screen, but this one is about uh, the Global Entrepreneur Summit. So what's your biggest takeaway from attending President Obama's Global <laughs> Entrepreneur Summit? Oh my goodness. I was there just taking it in and learning and everything. It was like Alice in Wonderland. It was Google <laughs> had this trailer that they had made out of uh, like uh, uh, th those, those containers mm -hmm. and they had made a Google now it's common, but back then I had never seen it before where you could walk up to it. It was like a mirror. You could walk up to it, but you could see people in another country and they could walk up to the mirror and you guys could talk to each other in real time. Um, I got to see how many countries, BlackRock and all these other countries that were investing in Africa because they felt like the money was there and the population, 50% of the population at that time was under the age of 35. So there's a lot of money being made. You know, we can talk about whether it's good and or bad in countries, but there's a lot of investing going on. Some mm -hmm. of it's not so great for the actual countries, but that's a different story. Um, I didn't get to be in the main room where Obama was speaking. I had to be in the overflow room, but I'm telling you when he walked in there, it was like he was a rock star. People were screaming. It was like the Beatles. People were yelling, screaming. People were like, I love you. It's like, yeah, I love you too. You know, it was like, <laughs> oh my God. That's a good impression. It was, it was, <laughs> it was freaking amazing. Uh, there was a bar co company that was making sure everybody had snacks and food. And because teams were coming from all over the country and all over the world. This was an event, this was the last event he was doing, but this was an event he had been doing every year for eight years and I only heard about it and got invited to the last one because one of my clients, uh, Goldie Blocks, 
she it was at Stanford. That was her graduate school. She was invited to speak, and she invited me up as a guest. That's how I got there. Wow. So she had raised uh, over $250,000 in crowdfunding for a game called Goalie Blocks to get girls interested in um, to get girls interested in uh, gaming, engineering. Oh, engineering. Yeah, uh, Goldie Blocks is the engineering game for little girls to get them interested in that. She's an she's an engineer. She invested uh, at least one hundred fifty thousand dollars of her own money, but I worked on the crowdfunding project and I got to be there. And it was just three days of just being super amazed by all these powerful countries, companies, and everybody was just jazzed to be there. So it was amazing. Oh, I bet that was cool. <clears throat> Question nine, as someone who has transitioned from healthcare to media and finance, what advice would you give to professionals considering a major career pivot? I would say um, that the pivot, focus on the pivot as your main, as your main goal. Take what you have from one and use that to pivot to your next thing. Don't start from the bottom. Use what you've learned. Use the tools you've created and developed and take them into your next step. And then that way you're starting a step up and not just on the bottom and you'll keep your momentum because people get tired of starting over and over again. So you want to keep momentum going and the pivot, a pivot instead of a start over can keep your momentum going. Mm, I like that a lot. Uh, what's your biggest misconception about what's the, the, from all that you face and you talk to a lot of people, what is the biggest misconception that people have about crowdfunding? Uh, that it's just, you just put it up there and people are going to magically give you money. They don't <laughs> understand that it's a financial tool. <laughs> they think you just go on there and I'll, I'll just sit here and wait for the money. And so they feel like there's, they think there's no effort that goes into it. They think that there's nothing happening. They, they, you know, they think it's kind of like magic. And when you understand that, no, you do have to work on it, but you have so much control that you can pivot inside of the crowdfunding project to make it do better. Or if you see that, hey, this is not going on the rails at all like I want, mm -hmm. you can pivot and stop the crowdfunding project. Crowdfunding can prove what you're doing and let you know, hey, don't invest all your money in this because either it's not set up right, it's not set up for the right person. You, you got to make sure everything is firing on all pistons. And so that's the biggest thing. And I literally have talked to people and said, well, I'll just go apply for a grant. Now, these people have not researched any grants. They don't know how to apply for a grant. They're not even set up. But instead of working on their own business, they rather try to apply for a grant. Because when you tell people you're applying for grants, it makes it sound like you're doing something. Mm -hmm. um, I believe in grants. You can have crowdfunding and grants. I believe in grants. But I just love about crowdfunding is the control that you have. That's good. That's really good. Uh, I want to ask you, we have something in common here in a way. <clears throat> How is your involvement with the All Ladies League and the Women's Economic Forum shaped your global perspective on women's economic empowerment? Well, I always wanted to see women uh, globally empowered. I don't think they shaped it. I think the opportunity with me for the All Ladies League was to help expand my own vision of reaching out to women around the world. They were exceptional in letting me get out to a bigger crowd. Um, I was an international foreign student when I was 16. I lived in Denmark. I went to business school in Malaysia. I've traveled the world. So they didn't uh, shape it, but they gave me opportunity. Yeah. And I and I love meeting women from all over the world and seeing what they're doing and, and being of help to help them go further. It's not all about, you know, trying to get a cow to a native lady in, uh, you know, in a... <laughs> in a there's more to it. There's a lot more 100%. women who are doing some really big things, and I love being a part of that too. Yeah, it, it absolutely. The this way I I didn't mean to laugh. I hope that wasn't appropriate for laughing. <laughs> no, I know you but know there, what there's I There's a lot of misconceptions about what people need and what people want, and like it's easy from America to assume what people in Africa need, but you won't don't actually know if you watch the news. That's not 
talk to someone there, work with an organization. That's how you find out what's needed. And to your point, the things that they need are more practical in nature than most of us would even consider. So I love that. Number 12, what's the, this, <clears throat> this is true. And this is one of the things that I complimented you on in the intro. You didn't see yet. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, it's to be in TV for five years is hard. I mean, you're 23 years, but I want to ask you, what's the most challenging aspect of keeping a show running for over 23 years? Oh, I, it is absolutely not getting bored. I did slow down tremendously when I started getting all these guests that were, they accidentally became rich and, you know, I did not, I can do anything. And then all of a sudden all these orders came in. <laughs> I, I was like, if I have to talk to one more person talking about that, I'm going to just, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I understand I that. It down tremendously. I wasn't, I, I was, I don't know what kind of bubble I was in, but I wasn't meeting interesting people like you. I was meeting very pedestrian people that had written these, you know, books that were just okay. <laughs> and, uh, and I just was like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. Yeah, And so I, I, you know, I did films for other people. I have other ways of making money than doing my show. I didn't throw it away, but I just, I did kind of put it on hiatus. I'm out of whatever that bubble is now. I'm meeting fantastic people that I can partner with, that I can bring on Right Place TV, but it's your own boredom. Mm -hmm. It's your own boredom. I don't interview people I don't like. I don't interview people I'm bored with. I, I just don't do it because it's not going to work for me. Um, and, uh, and I don't interview people who gatekeep. I literally had a woman who was, uh, I thought I was pre-screening her. I guess I didn't do a good job, but her, she was talking, going to talk about her success with crowdfunding because she had, she had gotten success with crowdfunding. Um, mm -hmm. number one, go fund me. This is the, this is a rule for me for business. Go fund me is not where I want to see clients go. GoFundMe has the whiff and stench of desperation, and I don't want my clients on there. So I don't interview people who've done stuff on GoFundMe because I want other business perspectives. Mm. So the number one rule is you, you it couldn't be a GoFundMe project. When we got to doing the show, it turned out she not told the truth, and it was a GoFundMe project. <laughs> then when we said, okay, well, we, we want details because you can't look at a crowdfunding project from the outside and go, oh, I know how they made the money. There's, a, there's some information that you don't know. Who are they connected to? How did they market it? Blah, blah, blah. I have a lot of connections. I would be able to market something very different from somebody who's just off the street. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, you know, she didn't want to share the details. Well, we, we just got the word out there. Okay, honey, how'd you get the word out there? Uh, d literally did not want to give the details. So I kind of cut the interview short and I guess she did not get the hint because you and I know what that means. If somebody cuts us off in the first five minutes, we're experienced. We know, Ooh, the chemistry wasn't there. They, they weren't digging in. We can kiss that one. Goodbye. So, but she didn't, she didn't get that hook at all. And so she called me, when is the show going up? So then I had to go through the Oxford explanation that the show is not going to air. <laughs> so, oh I'm sorry I'm laughing so much, <laughs> but I understand everything you just said. I and I felt it too because I know. Oh my gosh, I I yeah. I, oh, and I gotta tell you this other story too. So way back in the day when I first started, I used to ride my team hard and put hard and put them away wet. I would do five and six shows a day, like back to back to back. Mm -hmm. So we get this couple coming in. They're like the fifth or sixth show. And I guess they were tired. And so I open up with the first question to them and neither one of them said anything. And I guess I was tired and I said, it's a talk show. You got to talk. <laughs> <laughs> so we went on with the interview, but I was like, I should not have said that. My crew was like, wow. <laughs> 
I love you. <laughs> I was like, this is show number five, and you guys are literally not saying something. And that is a talk show host nightmare, the guest that doesn't talk. So oh. I, had to, I had to share that one with you because I knew oh, you were like, I, I have to refrain from sharing my story. <laughs> I can relate. I can just relate. All right. Next question. How do you balance your roles as a media personality, crowdfunding expert, and advocate for women and minority-owned businesses? I think it's just uh, I'm really good at kind of compartmentalizing and knowing, well, this person's coming from the crowdfunding. This is person is coming from the media side and my charitable side. That's you know something a little bit different. I literally have people who are in the crowdfunding tribe that have no idea that I have a TV show. And I've literally have people on the media side that have no idea that I am at the level that I am with crowdfunding. So it just sort of developed over time. I would talk to certain people about one thing and certain people about another thing. And then there's a small pool of people that understand the crossover. So it, I don't know. I just, I think I just, I'm able to compartmentalize. I don't like that word. <laughs> I can't say it. I get tripped up on that and a couple others that I won't try to say right now. Um, what inspired you to focus on crowdfunding as a tool for empowering underrepresented entrepreneurs? Because in 2010, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs could not get loans. They could not get money from banks and things were bad. And I saw crowdfunding as the answer to that. You don't have to go to a bank. You don't have to go to a lending institution and make sure you have good credit and all this. You could go to your people who want what you have, who want to support you and not be in debt and not have a credit check. And I just understood that it was a strategy that they just didn't know that they could have. Beautiful answer. <clears throat> and this one is a ton of value. So listen up, crowd. Audience that's listening right now, listen to this. Listen to this question because this one you need to hear. Number sixteen, in your opinion, what's the biggest untapped opportunity in the crowdfunding space right now? Ooh, the biggest untapped opportunity is to invest in youth-led businesses. Um, for a couple of years, I did a program with. Um, some kids in Irvine, California. Uh, and it was part of a, a Stand Up For Kids is a national organization for homeless children and homelessness under the McKinney-Vento. Uh, in other words, you don't have to be on the street to be a homeless child, but right. I'm not gonna get into that. So uh, I came into that program teaching these kids. They were doing a program where they were starting a business. And I was supposed to come in as, <clears throat> A teacher for one lesson and I wound up staying. <laughs> I just, I fell in love with these kids. These kids had businesses that you could put money into. One little girl wanted to start a makeup company. I showed her how you can get the lipsticks, you know, made by these other companies. And her dad invested $200 to help her get started. Aww. And she's just selling little lipsticks and makeups to little girls on campus. Uh, so it is, it, I love these these kids were junior high to high school kids and I just had such a fantastic experience and I would have loved we had one year we had investors invest in them we had the money set aside for them I would have loved to continue that program so the children could actually start their businesses I want to get involved with that that's what let's, I let's talk yeah we should talk okay number 17 <laughs> and I'm serious about that yes how has your approach to teaching and mentoring evolved from Dallas Startup Week to your more recent invest uh, engagements? I think um, the the that's very interesting. I probably need a little more thought on that, but I'm going to say off the top of my head is that um, the way I look at mentoring differently now is that I know that I can mentor someone. I'm not clear that everybody really wants to do the work. When some people are coming for mentoring, they mean do it for me. Uh huh. Really discovered. Not mentor me, not share an education with me, but just do it for me and just and just sit back. And uh, that's not what mentoring is. So 
I really don't feel like people really want mentoring. They want someone to come and do it for them. Mm -hmm. Just like they mix up the fact that angel investors are not like the movies where somebody gives you a mysterious check and you don't have to pay it back. An angel investor is a person who's investing their own money. They're the angel. And they expect you to, to make a return on the mm -hmm. money that they give you, not just yeah. burn it up and say, oh, well, thanks for the <laughs> so it's for the handout. Um, that's my biggest thing is that when people say they want to be mentored or they get angry because someone says, I have a mentoring program, but you have to pay for it. And they're angry about paying for it. And it's like, because we know for absolutely sure, unless you're a child under 18, it, it doesn't count, but most adults will do nothing with free mentor. And I don't want to waste my life. I want what I'm doing to have an impact on the world. <clears throat> really quick. I want to add something to that. I had to change my mentorship program. I've, I've mentored through a national organization for a while. I won't say their name because I'm about to say something negative um, because they're great. They're great. But the problem with the whole system that they have for giving free mentors is that literally they want people to do the work. And if you give them homework, they get offended and, or they, if you, they say, Hey, you, I suggest you read this book, you get offended. And so I had to change my mentorship program where I've required people to have skin in the game. In other words, you're going to have an opportunity to earn money like day one, but you're going to work. I, I worked for it. I volunteered. I sweat. I had nights of not sleeping and losing my home and all those other things. When I was learning, you think I'm just going to give it away. <laughs> I know you need it, but how bad do you want it? And the problem is, and, I, and, I, and this is not the same for everyone, but the people that should be hungry, as Les Brown would say, aren't. And I don't know what that's about, but I got to tell the whole world that's listening right now, there has never been a greater opportunity to pursue your dreams than right now, today, as we stand. And you don't need money or an education to do it, but you got to want it. Let's go to the next question, because I could tee off on that for four hours. What's the most valuable lesson you've learned from your global experiences in entrepreneurship and business education? Oh, I've learned a lot of valuable lessons. Um, wow, what's the most valuable lesson? Um, wow, I, I, I would have to think about that. I would have, I've learned so many lessons. And you know, when you're learning the lesson, it's of great value at that time. And then after you've known the lesson for a while, even though it's of great value to you, it's it's not the shining stone it used to be because you're learning True. another lesson. That's right. Uh, the lesson I'm learning right now, but that's right present before me, is roll with what's going on. Mm. This is a time where, yes, we have a plan. And every morning I get up and it's not going the way I planned. <laughs> so I can either, uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way, just different than what I planned. Doesn't mean it's necessarily going into the rut, but <clears throat> it's different, you know? And so I'm really learning to let go. God's got this, God's got me. Mm -hmm. I just need to keep up with what I'm supposed to keep up with and to stop worrying about so much stuff. I really, it's really revealed to me uh, how much my mind is into worrying mm. and not releasing, you know? Mm. It's like, pray about it, get settled in it. Don't spend hours and hours and hours worrying about, oh my gosh, is this interview gonna go okay? Do I have enough light? Do I have enough? Hey, it's gonna come together or it's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's okay. <laughs> and so that's the biggest, <laughs> Le lesson that I'm learning right now is that all that baggage, I cannot move forward with any of it. So I am in the process of letting go, you know, whether I get a massage or, or pray or, you know, do whole pono pono, whatever it is, you know, just you, whatever helps you let go and let go of your baggage, do that and doing it every day and consistent and staying light because there's so many changes happening every single day. And uh, I've got to be light on my feet. I can't be dragging any anything. So this is a really interesting time because I'm finding out, oh, well, look at that. Oh, 
well, look at that. Okay, something else I can get rid of. Mm-hmm. I love it. I say I surrender probably about 5,000 times a day, so I get it. Question 19, how do you see social media platforms like TikTok and Instagram shaping the future of crowdfunding and business promotion? I think that uh, if TikTok and Instagram incorporate it as part of their business stuff, they haven't done it yet, but you know, TikTok has a very you know good program in terms of making money. Out, out of all the programs, TikTok and, and the YouTube programs are the easiest ones to make money from. Um, if they incorporated people being able to crowdfund in a Patreon type of style, which they do have, they kind of have that Patreon type of style, but they're not pushing it and helping people un- really understand how to use it. So it's not super big. If they did that, uh, that, that, that would blow money. I mean, money would just be coming in. The first social media to do that will conquer all. I agree. Question 20. What's your most memorable experience as a teacher or speaker? <laughs> I'm gonna go back to I, I have two things. Uh, I teach at the Las Vegas um, SBA, Small Business Administration. And when lady was in class and she had her baby, and this was a baby. Whoa. Her baby was quiet and watching the class the whole time. And I told that lady, when she grows up and she's a rich, wealthy businesswoman, make sure you let them know she started below <laughs> one years old in Dr. Wright's class. Because her, I know her mom was nervous about having her there. I'm going to tell you that baby was the best behaved baby I ever saw in my life. Like <laughs> not a peep, not a peep. Um, the other thing is when I was uh, teaching the, the disadvantaged kids in Irvine, they were pitching to the investors. And I had a co-teacher, so I didn't see every piece of their pitch before at hand. But one time in class, I had said, the, the great advantage you have about being so young, don't worry about being so young. I told the kids, I just said it one time, I said, you're young, they won't see you coming. Well, when this one little girl got to pitching her business to the business people and she got to the part of the SWAT team, you know, what, what, you know, what's unique about you and everything she added, and I'm young, they won't see me coming. (laughs) I didn't expect that. I was like, I'm just like teared up. I was like, oh my gosh, she wound up winning the top prize. Oh, I love it. But I think that's, that is just like, I just absolutely love that. I love that. That's perfect. Oh, the last question. I may may cry now. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Looking ahead. Stage of life. So if you cry, I'm definitely going to (laughs) cry. Looking ahead, what's your vision for the future of crowdfunding and its potential impact on global economy equality? I definitely see crowdfunding uh, bringing more equality. Um, again, uh, tying into the different banking systems, you know, and the governments. It, they have to. Different countries have to figure out a way to make it work with their systems, and it not be looking like some sort of Nigerian scam. And so, um, I'm hoping for that. In some countries, it is not. Uh, legal. I teach for Cal State San Bernardino summer program. And many times the Romanians have said it is illegal in my country. So it's not legal to do crowdfunding everywhere yet, but it could level the playing field for so many people if they understood what it was, how to use it for business. I'm not talking about personal, for business and how it can be. And it's more than just a Kiva loan. There's more to it than that. So uh, I think it's huge. I think the potential hasn't even peaked yet. We're still on the the up curve. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I I I align with uh, what you stand for and, and what you're about, and you know, having to ha- getting to meet someone with your background and expertise, and you know, seeing the synergy. It's 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 comfortable. It's comforting for me. Um, because I'm part of a new generation as opposed to you, you've got both, you've got the new and old, you've got, you've got both. And that knowledge 
and wisdom is so beneficial because like while I know the new way of doing things and I don't need to ask permission in a lot of ways that had to be done with the old way, without the wisdom of the elders, so to speak, then I can make the same, I can fall into some of the same traps and mistakes if we're in the new style of media. And mm -hmm. so it's really, really a blessing to have people like yourself that understand both worlds so well, and yet you're prepared for the new one. So uh, I've enjoyed this. Uh, I just adore you. I cannot uh, wait to see what all happens with your new project. But um, I'm so grateful for your time. I would like to give you the last word. And I mean, literally, you, you get the last words. I won't say anything after this. Um, so please plug where people can find you. And if anything's on your heart to share, please share. Well, I'd love to say you guys can find me at Right Place TV Networks on Amazon Fire TV, Apple TV, and Roku. Please get the app, download the app. All the shows are free. Uh, you can find me on TikTok at Your Crowdfunding Expert. And also I have a separate account for media that is Right Place TV, like my name. So follow me there if you have any interest on that. And of course, I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram threads <laughs> a few other places and thank you for having me the last word that i just want to say is ignoring one's conscience is neither safe nor right so don't ignore what's on your heart go for it it'll bless your life and it'll bless others <laughs>